set, and we're good. Okay, brilliant. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today, I am yeah have the absolute pleasure to be joined by Dr. Andrew G. Huff, uh, a former Echo Health Alliance vice president turned whistleblower, uh, army combat veteran, scientist, and author of the book The Truth About Wuhan. Uh, Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Not a problem. I mean, I was. Uh, yeah, thrilled that, that that you got back to me and and that we can have this this conversation because um, as we we started talking about before before recording, um, you've been telling this story for two years and um, no one has come out and said that you're lying. No one has said that or challenged um, from from our conversation challenged anything that you've you've stated openly or and and yet no one's listening. It seems, or there's like a, a, a serious portion uh, of the world that is just not listening. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a pleasure to, to unwrap all this with you. Um, well, I look forward to it. And there are so many different things I could respond to in just that short introduction that you gave. It, really, for me, I had, some, had my suspicions about what had happened initially uh, it, going back to, to 2020, January 2020, I, I, I knew about the things going on at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I knew about EcoHealth, EcoHealth Alliance's relationships uh, with that laboratory, what what was happening in a different a number of different laboratories internationally related to gain-of-function work. And over that first year, my sense was that it was a lab leak. And there wasn't quite all the evidence to, to prove that, but I spent most of my most of 2020 just trying to convince people that it was a lab leak because, frankly, there wasn't the epidemiological evidence for it. And I knew right away, the one thing I, I, I knew was that everything the U.S. government was telling us about this agent and how it emerged, emerged was a lie. None of it made sense. There was cl conflicting information from... Uh, other subject matter experts in, in my field of epidemiology and biosurveillance early on. And the, the response rollout effort from the United States, none of it really made sense. And over time, I started asking more questions because when you see something that's so off and, and I worked, um, you know, in the government, in laboratories, worked with policymakers to help develop it, it and, and, create response plans, mitigation strategies, strategies for pandemics at one point in my career. And when I saw the, the, the cards that they were playing and the way that they're being played, it's not what we had put in a pandemic preparedness and response planning measures for various different government agencies. Um, so operating underneath the federal government um, or even with the overall national strategy of, of documents or policy documents that have been published going all the way back to 2005. So as that happened, I just have more questions. Well, why aren't we doing this? Why, why aren't we doing X or Y Z? Or why are we? Why is that a recommendation? None of this makes sense. And when you see that, oh, and thanks to a lot of hard work from other people out there, other virologists, geneticists, other independent scientists, the the whole story for me comes together by the end of twenty twenty. Yeah, which is the 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 wildest thing. Because yeah, here we are, end of twenty twenty two. But anyway, so we. Instead of getting right deep into uh, yeah the the start of COVID and then the response to it, let's let's like back up a little bit and and get get like a bit of perspective on like who you are, what your background is, and then how you ended up working at uh, Echo Health Lines, so people get uh, like a good idea of who you are. Yeah, well, um, I'm a strange duck, academically speaking. So, 9/11 uh, happens. I feel a patriotic duty to serve. A bunch of my friends are infantry, army infantry, rangers, marines, uh, special forces, those kind of people, and we all uh, volunteer to serve in the military. I enlisted in the uh, Army National Guard in the state of Minnesota, and then I went on to active duty um, for training and deployments. Uh, I was actually ordered to operation during freedom in Central America, fun, uh, fight, fighting the global war on terror. It was a really strange mission. I did uh, narcotics interdiction. I was actually trying to hunt down members of Al Qaeda doing sneaky things down there. Uh, a number of different things. It was a weird mission set for an infantryman. Uh, very, very cool though. It was sort of like, sort of like the movies in some ways, that, that mission. It's sort of like the, uh, it was a golden, golden ticket of the military for deployments. Everyone, everybody wants that deployment. Um, while I was down there, though, I, um, uh, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were really taking off or accelerating, mm -hmm. and I felt the need to volunteer to fight and serve, serve on those because 
frankly, I was at the peak of my, my, my training. I was coming off one deployment where it was actually probably a good warm up for going into one of those kind of environments. So I volunteered to, to fight in Iraq. Uh, during Iraq, I started studying in my mission downtime for a number of things, promotion within the military. I thought I might be a career officer at that point. Um, really, though, I, I need to get my under, undergraduate degree done. I was taking uh, correspondence courses while, while fighting, actually. Um, through St. Cloud State University, I transferred to the University of Minnesota, where I got a bachelor's degree, mostly research uh, focused on psychology. Master's degree was in security technology, so actually engineering security technologies. Uh, with a minor in geographic information systems. So sometimes people are not familiar with that, that term, but that's basically Google Maps and the system and the software that that digitally um, maps cartography and does spatial analyses, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I actually got into predicting terrorism and violent, violent crime and violent activities using these GIS systems. Um, I was looking for a corporate job. I was sick of school. And they... Uh, heavily recruited me to, to get a PhD in uh, public health. And my specialty track is environmental health science, uh, emerging infectious diseases, which oftentimes uh, is foodborne in nature for a lot of people specialize in food contamination, um, like salmonella, E. coli, those kind of things. Uh, that field is very heavily tied to epidemiology. They're, they're really only about two or three courses different, the two degree programs. Mine has a more of a population health or ecological ecology component to it. So we understand the system of how these diseases function. So the thing that I was recruited to, though, was the Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence. And because of my military background, my master's degree in, in, in national uh, being a national security focused, they wanted me to work on developing advanced um, data analytics and platforms for measuring terrorism or bioterrorism risk within the food supply. I got the most the best deal you can get um, as a PhD student. It was a full scholarship, plus about $100,000 a year salary, plus I had my Veterans Affairs benefits. It was an easy way to lure me into the program versus uh, getting a job in corporate America, which was my plan. So I take the offer. I want to get school done as fast as I can. I was taking 25 PhD credits a semester, which most people think is insane. <laughs> I basically put my, my, uh, my personal life, my family life aside, I finished the the program within three years, dissertation and all. It, it was expedited by by the fact that I didn't have to collect a ton of primary data. Some of that was actually handed to me to uh, handed to me by uh, the federal government and different state agencies. Published all my stuff, got out, um, and then I really had the the opportunity to select what government agency or national security body that I wanted to work for. So through my dissertation in the research center that I worked at, I was out in, that, in Washington, D.C. probably two times a month at minimum, meeting with high-level stakeholders or policy or bureaucratic experts in national security from different domains, mostly public health or, or food and agriculture. And... I met I met all these people, and I was being groomed to be at the end of my my PhD um, or different corporations. I mean, I really had the ability to go a lot of different places, and I I I had my my sights set on working in one of the national laboratories. So, two of my people that I presented my work to became my friends um, at Sandia National Laboratories. They they recruited me in very quickly. Uh, two of my other mentors, you know, basically made a, a couple phone calls and, and made that happen. And then basically I'm working in the classified side of public health, um, pandemics, bioterrorism, and other other things I can't talk about. But uh, just say, you know, national security, defense kind of stuff in, in public health and bio. And I saw my work increasingly getting classified as I work there. So... It's a fine line, you know, there's this debate in security, whether things should be published. So open security means if we publish things, then everyone knows about the risk and the threat, and then steps will be taken to mitigate those risks. So we see this debate more often in the tech security and information security world, or should we keep those vulnerabilities or risks or things that we learn private and keep that secure? Well, I think the work that I was doing related at least to public health should be out in the open domain because public health affects everyone. And you know, the more people that we have watching out, looking out for threats or concerns that 
can address those and the more secure, safe, and healthy the population will be. Well, I had some people I was working with that were very much the opposite end of the spectrum and they wanted to classify everything. So my, my work's getting classified, my work's getting classified. And I'm like, well, if they keep classifying my work uh, as a PhD level scientist, I will be stuck here at this laboratory or in the federal system the rest of my life. I'll never be able to get out of it. And that with sequestration and funding cuts to my area of work was just making life difficult. So I decided to look for other jobs and I came across this place called Equal Health Alliance. And Equal Health Alliance had the mission of uh, through conservation, we will something, it was, their mission statement was something to the effect of through con uh, conservation, we mitigate the risks of emerging infectious diseases. And actually that sounded really cool, sounded neat. There was actually a lot of truth, truth to that statement scientifically. It just turns out when I started working there, I learned that wasn't really the case of the kind of work that they were doing. And um, I sort of bought into the mission and everything I was being told about the organization. Then over time, I learned it was something else. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is odd. Unfortunately, sometimes the thing with the things that seem like dream jobs, they end up being the very thing you tried to escape from. I've had that probably happen to me before. Um, yeah, it, that's exactly what happens to me. I, I, so it's funny. I go from working at what I'm trying to get away from is like the, the defense, military, medical, industrial base. I didn't want to have a security clearance anymore. You know, I, I don't like I didn't like the probing in, into my personal life. Not that there was anything there, but all this is, you know, it's leverage that the government maintains over you when you work in one of these positions. And I want to away from that. I wanted to be like my friends in corporate America. They didn't have to deal with all this, this extra scrutiny and fear all the time. And, it, the, the reality is when you work at a national laboratory like I worked at where they work on the most advanced weapon systems, nuclear nuclear technology, stuff like that, I'm on a watch list the rest of my life. <laughs> so if I start making phone calls to, to Russia or China, I mean, I'm, they probably have some machine learning algorithm that, that cues it to some analyst at Langley. And next thing you know, oh, Dr. Huff's talking to, to someone in China. What is that about? Let's listen to it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's, you know, there's nothing going on. That's the reality of how their, their systems work mm, yeah. anyways. Yeah. So I tried to get, tried to get away from it. Um, and oddly, I wound up working in the very environment that I was trying to get away. I just, I didn't know it. Mm. So briefly, why, why was the, your work being increasingly classified? Was it due to the, the nature of the things that you were working on or is that, was it, is it is it like becoming an increasing trend where things just sort of get classified as as standard? Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. And when you added the second part of your question, and I think that that might show some insight you have to the problem. So there's two things happening right now, um, or that have been happening over the last twenty years in, in the national security community. One, there's increasing classification. So more and more things are getting marked as classified, which probably shouldn't be, but. What happens is the person that does classification, uh, they're called derivative classifiers. That's their job title or extra duty that they're assigned. They get scared. Um, they get scared because they don't want, if there's fallout from the, the document getting released and it's not classified, they're going to be held accountable. So people are scared. So then it's a lot easier to classify something and to be overcautious and overprotective of a document. Uh, there's more incentive to do that than not. And so in my case, I think that the two, the two are related. So the people that I was working with for derivative, derivative classification, um, I don't think they were very good at their jobs. Uh, they were managers and they also didn't have the technical capacity or subject matter expertise to understand the risk reward uh, scenario for the material that they were reviewing. So they had no, no way to put the information into the, the correct, the risk analysis and into the correct context. And when you're, you know, if you're trying to argue with somebody who doesn't understand what they're talking about, what you're talking about, mm -hmm. the argument's not going to go anywhere anyways, because if you're talking about high level PhD specifics of pandemic emergence with, with a person that um, has a, you know, a policy degree or a MBA, the conversation's not going to go anywhere because that person has to have four or five extra years of training in your field, plus the experience to have a, a nuanced debate, right? So you're, you're, you, end up, you end up arguing with people that just don't 
understand what you're talking about. So you can be you can be effective in winning those arguments, but you know your time is worth something. And outside the net, you know, outside the the, the government or or either or private or corporate laboratory, or private or government laboratories, where this kind of classified research takes place. That's not how I want to be spending my time arguing with managers about what should or shouldn't be classified. If all the scientists sort of agree and it goes to that person to review the document, it just, you know, it should be clear. But sometimes, and that's not always the case. I mean, there are, you know, that was my experience. I know other derivative classifiers or people that I weren't assigned to that were actually highly effective and really good at their jobs. So it just depends who you get assigned to. In my case, there's no getting away from it. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's just government culture. It's difficult to change. Anyway, so to move towards uh, the the declaration that you've made to to Congress and and the the story that you've been you've been trying to tell, and you will uh, uh, yeah lay out further in the book uh, the truth about Wuhan. I'm not I'm not sure where the best place to start with this is. That like do you do you think we talk about like what the official story is and then maybe you can go through why you think that's blatantly untrue i mean sure i mean here here's the issue i don't know what the official story is anymore because at <laughs> least, you know if we look at if we look at what the u.s government has released i think they've either I can't tell whether or not they're intentionally mud muddying the waters or the U S government is being so mismanaged at, at the mo moment that different agencies are just putting out different messages. So I don't know whether or not it's intentional to muddy the waters or they're just not organized. And I, I have friends, plenty of friends who are, who are great quote unquote deep state people that I've worked with that really don't know either. So it, it uh, it's it's difficult to to, to tell okay. well, what's then maybe, going on. Maybe let's let's okay. So that at least at the time when COVID started to to spread beyond China, and it became apparent that it was going to be a, a, a an issue for the for the world at large, the accepted narrative was this came from a wet market in um, Huanan. I think it's Huanan province or um, the Huanan wet market i'm probably butchering that anyway a wet market in wuhan the, yeah the, 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 yes well a seafood market actually not seafood. even a wet market so technically the title of it was seafood market seafood market and and the huanan the huanan uh, seafood market i probably pronounced it wrong but it was a seafood market and actually this is one of the first things that raised a red flag Okay, so first of all, I find out about the pandemic about two weeks before official sources and chatter pick, pick up. And I, I find out through other subject matter experts who say there's something happening in China. Mm. When was, when was this then? So I go look at mid-December of 2019. Mid-December, okay. Yes. And um, so I use my spatial analyst techniques for investigation. This is one thing that I've always done throughout my career once I, once I learned is that I go pull um, so I started thinking in my mind, what are other ways to, to validate this? So if there's a big infectious disease outbreak going in a big city, they cremate bodies. That's one of the things you have to do. You have to get rid of the bodies quick. So I go pull PM uh, 2.5 data. Uh, PM stands for particulate matter, and it's com commonly used in, in environmental health or environmental or popu uh, population or, or air, air pollution uh, um, analysis and there's tons of tools to do it and china actually has because of all the air pollution has for this stuff i go do some plume dispersion modeling on those data and i see that there's point source emission from cre crematoriums in and around the wuhan area so it looks like all the, these crematoriums are working overdrive now on that little aspect about four months later i talked to an, a few other scientists that are sort of in the intelligence science national security world as well they independently did the same thing I did, had the same results. So they told me, yeah, we did the same thing. I'm like, well, that makes sense because, you know, people like us think the same. So that's how I sort of confirm about what's going on. So when the narrative starts coming out that there is this big, you know, there's a, there's an infectious disease event happening in China. It's not airborne transmissible. It's not going to a big deal. That's what they're telling us at first. I'm going off the rails 
uh, I'm calling up my friends in the public health community, other doctors, scientists, people in government saying, why aren't we doing more here? I mean, if, if, if you are going to have travel bans, that would have been the time to do them. That's a, in, initially you can do a travel ban. They can be effective. Um, but it's only a short window and it's usually, it's a stop gap. So like we're going to lock down for two weeks. Let's stop travel for two weeks. Okay. You just do it to buy time real quick. Mm. Then you can say, then we can lock down for two weeks after that two week travel ban period. Maybe you're slowing it down so you can get your response into place. Okay. And then you just, you're supposed to let it go. But we didn't do any of that. So <laughs> wear masks. Don't wear masks. I mean, this whole, all this uh, going back and forth from uh, De- Dr. Anthony Fauci himself. I'm like, does this guy know what he's talking about? I mean, because every time he, he was flip-flopping on things. He's like, no, nobody needs to wear masks. Well, it was a lie. I mean, it was a lie. And the whole the whole framing of masks was crazy to me, too. So when they, in 2020, when they start talking about masks, everyone in my community thinks of masks being... N95 or hot, better respira- at respirators. That's what, how we conceive masks. And that's how I think the population conceived or perceived what masks were or interpret that. Because what they were trying to do is they're trying to prevent a run on PPE at Lowe's, like uh, the hardware stores, Ace Hardware, Lowe's, um, any place that would sell that kind of personal protective equipment because they wanted healthcare workers to be able to get it. Mm. Now, I believe that the government should be honest to us. So if there was a shortage in PPE and they understood what was going on, which I believe to be the case, and it's, it's, I shouldn't even say believe, there is factual evidence to prove that Anthony Fauci himself and probably Dr. Burks knew back in time exactly what this was in the, earlier in December. Um, a man by the ma- name of Charles Rixey has done this analysis of the information when they had it. So they're lying to us. And I pick up on the fact that they're lying to us. So the more and more that these lies come out and the, there's the flawed science that they're stating as fact uh the more i dig my heels into the ground it's just saying no it, this is not right this is not accurate and eventually you know that goes on for a year to the point where i come forward and i say well here's the rest of the story of what was going on at eco-health alliance then the u.s government targets me for a bunch of criminal activity and, and harassment yeah. Okay. So then, uh, I just I I thought there's there's a great little summary um at the end of your your declaration, and I think that just just like sums up quite a lot of like how deep how deeply involved you were here in in Echo Health Alliance. Um, just it's, it's, I think it's good for people to hear. So um, it says after being promoted to vice president, Doctor have had access to information about the organization's finance and learned that Echo Health was heavily dependent on government contracts to remain solvent and cash flow was often tight. And you observed firsthand that uh, they engaged in minor fraud over billing. Um, you were involved in meetings and informal discussions during which game of function research was discussed. Uh, you were directly participated in USA, or it was uh, during a direct participation, sorry, in USAID Predict the program. Uh, you saw the first hand that Echo Health Alliance paid to feel adequate attention to biosafety, biosecurity, and risk management. Um, then you also met uh, Dr. Shi Zheng Li, uh, otherwise known as the Bat Lady, and uh, Dr. Ralph Barrick, uh, attending presentations where they discussed the work on designing and engineering SARS-CoV-2 um, and the use of humanized mice in experiments. And you're involved in the creation of a slide deck presentation to InQtel, which included included um, use of the USAID Predict funding to collect co- coronavirus samples from bats all over the world to analyze these viruses and identify their most dangerous features to humans and then create chimeras to test on humanized mice. So you were witness to a ridiculous amount of things within um, within yeah, the, your time at Echo Health Alliance, all of which point very directly towards the idea that there's a fair chance that this virus came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. No, there's only two chan- There's only two two answers here possible. It either came off out of a U.S. laboratory, or it came out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, if you look at the Lancet's latest, uh, the Lancet Commission's latest publication, they put their finger back at a U.S. laboratory. There, there are a few different U.S. laboratories that it could possibly have came from, from the way that they they share 
um, genetic information on on databases where and then they can synthetically make these viruses now. I mean, that's how advanced the technology is. It, it, it has advanced so much from 2014, 2015, the time that I worked at Eco Health Alliance. It, it, it's crazy. I mean, the, the, field, the field of biology, biology, virology and microbiology is advancing at a rapid pace. There's gonna be a huge, huge amount of growth and development in, in that space. Now, in the context of Eco Health Alliance, it, it really changes once I'm, I'm how I perceive the organization and what I, what I see to be really really going on and really happening. Uh, once I'm promoted to vice president, by that time I realized, well, really we're doing a lot of intelligence community, department of defense, um, biosurveillance, biotechnology kind of work. And man, I thought it was really cool. Um, I was excited and I'm like, well, hey, this is a roundabout way to use my, my military background, my experience, because the reason why I was getting promoted up and and so quickly in the organization where I was growing is that I was really de developing and expanding the relationship with the three-letter agency, Department mm -hmm. of Home Homeland Security, Department of Defense, the intelligence community. I mean, that, that was the area I worked in, and all of a sudden, I'm doing this under the guise of, of conservation. So, well... Uh, Dr. Dasik is out telling the world that he's saving the world with conservation. I really understood the customer, okay, and what the customer wanted. And I knew how to present that information to them in a way that they were receptive to. And the kind of money that Equal Alliance was asking for in Department of Defense box is like, you know, a nickel. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah. ask, you ask the Department yeah. of Defense for a million dollars and you just ask them for a nickel. And you, maybe you should be asking them for 50 cents. And that was sort of my attitude when working with um, with Dr. Dasik and uh, the other executives at Eco Alliance. Like, well, we can ask for more money here, and we should maybe do our contracts different. So I was making the the organization more profitable. And, and Eco Alliance, when I when I started working there, really was was living hand to mouth. I mean. Um, I, had, I had seen a high turnover of staff in the organization to be very stable employees. They go to a place five, 10 years, their whole career titles for people who'd come in and out of the organization or for affiliations that weren't really doing a whole lot. Like, you know, they'd say they're a research fellow. Well, it's not really clear what this person's doing with Eco Health Alliance. And, and Eco Health Alliance did that to make, make them see, seem bigger than what they really were. I mean, and that's what the organization was. Fake it till you make it. We're bigger. We're huge. We're doing all this. And they did that through, a, you know, Dr. Peter Dask did that through a lot of what I feel are interesting manipulative techniques. It, right down to the, Lance, the original Lancet Commission trying to figure out the origin of SARS-CoV-2, where he weasels his way onto it. And uh, he tells everyone, well, this definitely came out of this uh, seafood market. Um, so Equal Alliance had a lot of a lot of strange things going on there. Yeah, I met Ralph Barrick and and uh, Shi Zheng Li. They gave presentations during the lunch hour, um, which would be typical of any academic institution. Actually, that's very common in academia. You have visit, visiting faculty or people that you're doing research with, and they show up during you know to meet meet or do work or. Maybe they have other presentations with other people that they have to meet in the area. So they come and give a presentation and shake everyone's hand, hand at the office. And frankly, I looked at their, their work as being boring <laughs> when they came to I'm interested in. So I, I'm more on the technology, data, analytics side of epidemiology. Um, or I get more excited about clinical trials, those kind of things. Those are the areas that I'm interested in. So when they're talking about doing their gain of function work on, on mice, I'm not a mice guy. I've worked in a couple you know, rat labs in my life, and mm -hmm. I don't want to sit there and stick mice and do that kind of stuff. Yeah. It doesn't appeal to me. So when they give their work, I, I'm skeptical of how they can do that to actually predict emerging infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. But... That someone you work with, you have contractual relationships with those people in their institutions. You're not rude to them. You just don't ask any questions. Found it boring. Went, went, went back about my own work. In terms of the biosafety, biolaboratory risks that I observed, um, it was just really strange how once I become more aware of the organization, what's happening at Eco Alliance, and I see more of what's going on, they're just more red flags. So uh, initially, when I started working at EcoHealth Alliance, 
I'm asked to review a proposal which had already, and this is the understanding bat coronavirus risk proposal. Um, I'm asked to review this thing. And I comment to Peter that we don't have a biological security or safety officer. Um, we don't have an institutional biosafety committee. Just like quick comments like, hey, I took a look at this document. It looks really good. I have these few comments. What about these things? Yeah, don't worry about that. You know, we've got that taken care of. Mm -hmm. New employee at the organization, new scientist. Okay, sure. You got to take care of. I'm not going to, how, how do I know any differently? And why would I argue with you? It's not the kind of thing scientists ever lie about. Mm. And, you know, that's part of, part, of, part of the problem, again, of function work is that the way that the rules have been set up, at least in the United States, is that it, it relies on the scientist and the institution to be honest in their reporting and their assessment of what they're doing. Mm. <laughs> and if you're nefarious in any way and there's really no check on that power mm. so when page 127 and if people want to go check out my twitter account it's ag huff i've posted these documents and i've made them public you can go download them and look at your several times but i do it again so more and more people can see these things and a couple other scientists that actually worked in partner laboratories of eco health, eco health alliance looked at my assessment of what i happened what had happened with this understanding uh, the risk of bat coronavirus emergence proposal. And they say, yeah, this actually looks like exactly like gain of function. Oh yeah, this select agent form um, has a lot of omissions on it and they, they didn't des describe things properly or holy crap, it looks like Dr. Huff is right. Well, yeah, I'm right. I don't, I, I'm a natural, you know, I held a, Held a top secret clearance for the U.S. government. Do you think I go go around lying about things? It's not a good way to maintain security. It's not a good way. To, it's not a good way to, 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 go, to maintain a security clearance. Do you still have I mean, security? Do you fire people for this Do you still have like top secret security clearance? Um, it, well, it's not good practice to, to, to say whether you do or don't. But I okay. don't. Mine, mine expired. Um, mine expired. Uh, it becomes it becomes so it becomes something called inactive, but then it's good for a certain number of years, typically seven. And I think mine became inactive in like twenty twenty one. Okay, so they they or didn't 20, like 20. but like they didn't strip you of it because of the things so, you've been saying. So no longer active, but it, well, no, you're you're not really. So what is it's weird how the, the process works. People don't understand. So you get the background investigation. So then after the background uh, investigation is complete and approved, it's good for a period with top secret typically uh, for seven years. And then you have to have another investigation. So what happens when I stop working at, at Eco Health Alliance is that they take it away. And so it's no longer active. So if you want it reactivated, you can go back to a different government agency and say, hey, I have just worked, left this other job, we deactivated it, can you reactivate it? So then they can re easily reactivate uh, clearance if it's within the designated period. I think for secret clearance, it's like 14 years or 10, it's a longer period of time, lower level clearance. So, anyways, those are the rules around leaked classified information. I never will be classified information. They're listening to my calls and all my stuff all the time. And everything that happened at Equal Health Alliance wasn't classified. I mean, it was a a conservation.org institution when we're, we're doing academic work, supposedly. Mm. So all these things that I'm saying are because this is all in the public domain. And what, what's so ridiculous about this whole thing, and I've, I've, I've asked this question to a number of people, why is the U.S. government redacting emails from a academic institution, that being NIAID, so Dr. Anthony Fauci, or other government agencies that are funding work at a conser conservation organization. So if there's nothing bad or nothing nefarious here, and I think everyone in the world now believes that this, this damn thing's a lab leak. I, I don't think there, there's anyone out there who believes that this is naturally emerging. Um, over the past weekend, the, the Zunati, and I don't know if your 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 uh, listeners or followers are, are familiar with that term, but the Zunati is a joke that people like me have for Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Barrick, Dr. Dasik, and their um, academic uh, sycophants that are running around the world telling everyone that this emerged out of a wet market. Well, somehow, <laughs> somehow what happens is when this is the strange thing. These people, these academic sycophants that nobody 
nobody knows or ever heard of. All of a sudden, after this disease emerges, emerges they have like 100,000 followers, 200,000 followers on Twitter, like within a matter of months. So social media gives these people a boost to go around oh, and yeah, further no, people rise yeah. as, their, as their fact. And this past week, these people have a meltdown on Twitter. And tens tens of thousands of their tweets disappear. It happened this past weekend and the end of last week. No way. They're, they're deleting tweets. Yeah, yeah. They're deleting tweets as fast as they can. And uh, they're trying to save face on this thing because uh, me and a handful of other people have brought this damn thing down. And it's only going to get worse over the next few weeks. We have lawsuits that are being filed. Um, I'll say there's a lawsuit that's going to be filed this week in the state of New York. And we're going to get the, the discovery on everything. Guarantee oh, it. So hang on. This you, is is, are you getting, so you think you're going to get discovery? Yes, we do. Wow. I, I'm, I'm highly confident. Okay. Well, because there's another, there's, there's a whistleblower from, guess what? The Chinese laboratory as well. Oh. And that whistleblower aligns with what I'm saying independently. Well, that's, that's such a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. I'm going to, excuse my language here, this hands, but fine. you know what? Fuck these people. They killed six million people. They lied to they lied to the world. The entire planet. Um our our leaders, political leaders from the Democrats, right? And guess what? All we have to do here is simple. The only thing that we're asking for, I'm asking for, let's just tell the truth about what happened and then plug the holes in the system so it doesn't happen again. Here's a fun fact that your your audience might not be familiar with. This is not the first time an agent has leaked from a laboratory and caused a pandemic. Most people don't know that. Not the first time. Um, the, it actually happened in 1977 in a with a strain of influenza from a Russian laboratory. Whoa. Yeah. And you can go look this Didn't up. It's that. not conspiracy theory. Yeah, it's not conspiracy theory. Most people don't know that. And did that start a world war? Did anyone freak out about that? No. And it took a number of years to, to figure it out. They didn't figure it out right away. But guess what? The world moved on. And so what happened is we had a bunch of bad bad apples who were at the top of the U.S. government related to SARS-CoV-2, that being Anthony Fauci, that being Dr. Burtz. They knew damn well what was going on. And they go into cover-up mode so they're not blamed for it. Simultaneously, then they push a treatment which is being shown to be more and more dangerous by the day, that being the, the SARS-CoV-2 mRNA platform. Hmm. You can now say that on YouTube. So here we, it all falls back. Yeah, you're not supposed to. Well, I said the platform. I, I mean, I don't know what to say. It's looking more and more dangerous, okay? Yes. I'm yes, just quoting yes. the scientific literature here, and I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to get this, but there looks to be more consequences associated with the, the platform every day. Mm. And I didn't say the magical B word. No, I was going to say, I think you we can you can get away with saying it on YouTube now, because I've had several guests get away with saying it now. So um, I think they've, they've, they've sort of walked back a little bit on some of their uh, community guidelines designed to protect us all. Um, but like, so the well, thing- Well, do, do you know the funny thing? We were talking about YouTube censors real quick. You know, and I work. I work in with like you know. I got one foot in the tech world, and I got one one foot in the public health health world, and, and both are typically very uh, heavily left liberal skewed. And there's a tendency among those populations to believe government officials in, in health. And you know, in the past, with good reason, they've provide provided to us pretty good public health information over the course of history, at least in the U.S. So why would these people lie to us? Hmm. And that's a natural question to ask. And um, I think part of the strategy was to politicize this. And if you look at the insanity of what was happening in the Trump administration leading up to this, all the devices, device, 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 you know, goodness, hmm. in the U.S. around this whole thing, I mean, it, it almost brings me to tears how this, has ruined public health because they politicize this whole thing. I mean, a lot of this was so preventable. We just had to, to have, have leader leadership from either, you know, either side of the political spectrum, anyone to stand up and say, we made a mistake here. 
Let's correct this. Let's move on. Even like, so just let's, let's think about a different, different potential scenario here. Imagine if, so SARS-CoV-2 comes out and they would have said, you know, it looks like we made a mistake here. We have an experimental drug we want to try that we've been working on since 2015 mm. related to this. We want to give this a shot. Okay. Then we find out that this experimental thing didn't go the way that we wanted to exactly. Yeah. How do you think people would perceive that whole situation now? Do you think people would be upset, out screaming at, at the government because the experiment didn't go well? Do you think that people would be a little bit more understanding of how this happened? Mm. I mean, simple. If they would have just came out and said, we made a mistake here, we, we need to fix this. Oh, by the way, we've been working on a solution for this very problem. We have it. Can we try it? Everyone would have said yes. Yeah. Or, you know, they, they, there would have been there would have been a totally different the public would have responded differently to that. So yeah. and, and the problem because the 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 path that they, they decided to go down were cover it up, lie, create all this this huge fabrication of what's going on. Get it's now Colbert created <laughs> Yeah. Well yeah, and there could be a ton of distrust against public health officials. Mm. So now when I when I, I go out and I tell people you should get a flu vaccine, which I believe, and I think there's data to, to support that, all these other people are going to be distru- distrusting it because it's a vaccine. And the the devil is always in the details whether or not you should get any individual medical treatment procedure or a vaccine. And it should be based on the individual's co- potential comorbidities, risk factors, and all the nuance of the stuff has gone away now. So basically, there's a bunch of distrust in public health and medicine. And it's going to take at least 20 or 30 years for that to go away. Yeah. Because a lot of the damage that's been done is going to take that long to correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, a bit some sort of some sort of like owning up or, or, or prosecution of, of the people involved would probably help that. You know, if if you know people could be seen to to see that that there is you know justice in the world, that might that. But it, honestly, it feels increasingly like we don't live in that world where where that that can happen. But like, there's something I wanna I wanna go through here just because like the stuff that we've talked about here is like a, a tiny tiny fraction of the stuff that we know about about what's happened or the, about what we know about the development and funding of coronavirus research in Wuhan. So we know that the, the US government will, um, put a moratorium on it. Um, that moratorium was like somewhat ignored um, with some of the research and funding that went uh, went towards Echo Health Alliance and to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. We know they were working on um, bat coronaviruses. We know that they were working on something approximating gain of function um, uh, within them we know that they were working on them infecting uh hu- hu- like what's it isn't it uh genetically the engineered humanized mice, mice humanized mice bats. that's that's the 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 phrase i was looking for yeah the humanized mice and bats, uh, and bats. we know <laughs> that we have the 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 furin cleavage site within so, uh, SARS-CoV-2 that is uh, less than a one in a billion chance that that was in there by accident that if people don't know this, this is is uh, it's a portion of a a patented virus by Moderna from 2015 that the sequence of which is in SARS-CoV-2, and there's yeah less than a one in a billion chance that that's by accident. We know we have all of the emails about them covering up the the, the or their attempts to cover this up. We have. <laughs> Um, that uh, there was, uh, I think it was like half of the people originally who got infected within the within Wuhan. Like at least half of them didn't have any link to the the seafood market whatsoever. We had, I don't think any bats in the entire province of Wuhan tested um, positive for anything approximating this uh, this like strain of coronavirus there was no pangolins tested, no proof ever of of uh, animal to human transmission. Why the fuck is this a debate? Like, actually, why is this a debate? Why is this not the biggest fucking story on the planet? Like, you should be, honestly, This I was thinking about this last night. In a serious world, you are the on, on every single news channel. The Anthony Fauci has cameras outside his fucking door asking oh. for the truth. Like, Peter Daszak oh, has dude. cameras. Like, like where is yeah. that? Like, well, why is that not happening? It's going to be... 
Josh, you know what? I'm sort of like the the Forrest Gump of Bioterror because there, there's something another aspect of the story that nobody else uh, knows here. So I caught the FBI and the Michigan State Police um, breaking into my house repeatedly. I caught them. So the Michigan State Police, my state's a governor, a Democrat who's very tie- closely tied to the Biden administration, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Um, breaking into my house repeatedly, doing all sorts of the harassment. The source of it is the FBI and the Michigan State Police. Well, some of these people who work at these two agencies are idiots because one of the things that they stole from my house, the hard drives contained data that was used um, to, to create classified materials for the U.S. government. So um, back to what I told you what I normally did. So that, that Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence, where I got my Ph.D., I did most of the research on how they classified food and ag systems, meaning which ones were the most critical and secure to the United States, along with creating the formulas, the methods, the rationale, the specific nuance and all the detail of how you would attack these facilities. I, I, I created a lot of that work for the U.S. government. And a lot of that has been published in peer review. If your audience who wants to see it, you can search, search for my name, Andrew G. Huff. FASCAT, F-A-S-C-A-T, and that is the anonymized work, some of it. Well, they stole the cookbook from my house. It wasn't classified, um, but it was used to create top secret level information. And never in a million years did I think this would go missing from a safe inside my house. I reported this to the FBI, the USDA, the FDA, um, what other three letter DHS, three letter agencies. Um, no one has returned a phone call to investigate where these data went. The FBI didn't even know what they were. And we're in the process right now, Tom Renz and I, of notifying state attorney generals that their basically classified information has been stolen. And the federal government has refused to investigate it. I recently just passed this information on to Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson's office because I was sitting on this, this sort of, um, you know, ace in my hole. And I actually have a, I have a couple more tricks up my sleeve. They're going to investigate this information. They, they decided to screw with the wrong guy. I, I had wanted to get away from this uh, stuff my whole life. But the truth is going to get out there. And maybe I will be on the front page of work. Because have you heard about the recent string of food and agri- agriculture attacks around the globe? Uh, yes, I, I, I had. Well, I haven't actually heard anything in the last month or two, actually. But I had been, I had been following a string of stories of like wet grain warehouses burning down and uh, food markets and like yeah. So I had, I had seen that 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 Josh, trend. I did the analysis on my my data. So the attacks are seventy percent correlated. But then I ran a more sophisticated a statistical test. And really, you can run what's called a student's t-test on this for two samples, meaning you compare the frequency of attacks with the overall population of facilities that run the initial analysis, because that's how good I am at national security. Uh, in ter- t- terms of what's called a t-score, the t-score was 256, meaning it was it's basically impossible that these attacks were not derived from these data. So that means... The drives that went missing from my house were used to inform the attacks. It means that the other person that could have these data, and I'm not going to name it, uh, him, is a high-ranking military official. They were stolen from him, or they were stolen from the Department of Homeland Security directly, or someone else used the exact same, came up with the same method of analysis for risk and compiled all this information themselves and then decided to attack our own critical infrastructure. So this is my guess what happened. These Michigan State Police idiots that have been doing this, because they're not very smart, I've met them, and I've actually met the, the FBI people, I've identified them. There's, they came in here, they stole this crap from my house, and they probably went down to the local pawn shop and just dropped it off or gave it to Goodwill because they're doing it to, to harass me. But I didn't really think what was on the drives or analyze the information. They got rid of it, and it probably fell into enemy hands. That's my guess. That's pure speculation on my point. 
on my part, but the statistical analysis of a Z score or a T score of 256, I've never seen that in a, in a real world experiment in my life. I mean, if you're talking standard deviations, you get super excited. If you see four or five standard deviations from normal, mm. and you see something on a T-test, 256, that's like um, I'm tossing, uh, you know, I'm picking which atom I'm going to hit in a pool and I'm tossing a dart into it. You know, like, it's just, uh, it's insane. You know, so it's like, it's, it's so it's so improbable for that that alignment to be there. Um, yeah, so that's that's the other weird part of the story. So through through the US government trying to harass me, intimidate me into not speaking about what we've been talking about, they inadvertently probably released a highly sensitive data set into the open market. Somebody has it. Wow. And they're, 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 and if they refuse to talk to me or answer these questions, I'm just gonna, we're going to the state attorney generals and they're gonna investigate. And the states can say it's because it's their data, right? So the state governments lost their data on the safe that was sold from my house, plus the corporations lost that. People are going to ask questions. I've already shared this information with a number of people. There, there's going to be charges. You know, they say Nuremberg 2.0. The problem is none of us ever works as fast as we want it to. Mm. You know, everybody wants a trial right away. Well, there's no things that have to happen first so in the u.s government the politicians both democrats or republicans need to believe they have political support to do the the political side mm -hmm. of this uh state attorney generals within their own state need to believe that they have the support of the people because they're lifetime they're elected or they're appointed by the governor they need to believe they have the support of the people to bring charges so all these 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 government employees need to believe that they have the support but in our country if everyone falls for, in, and globally right now, actually, if everyone falls for the false the false narrative that there is about to be global war and we're all in conflict, well, every time I go to the grocery store, I go and visit somewhere around the United States, I don't see anyone at conflict and everyone looks perfectly happy buying their, their Fritos and buying Coca-Cola, beer, whatever. I'm not seeing this, you know, Democrats and Republicans are about to kill each other. But if you go on social media or the news, that's, that's what it looks like. They're really trying to pump this global conflict stuff. Now, in Europe, it's a little bit different story with Ukraine and what's going on. Mm. But don't buy the fear. I mean, humans and globally, I think we have more in common than we ever did. And that, that's globalism. Like it or not, you know, that's globalism has caused that. And people call me a globalist because I point, point things out like this. But I'm like, is this merely a fact? We all have more in common now. We've become more similar in ways. You know, and that's a far stretch from, you know, global government dominance, which some, you know, people point to the WEF and uh, the World Economic Foundation. You know, those are definitely stated goals of theirs, but it doesn't mean we have to buy in and support it. And at least within the United States or the United Kingdom, we take care of our own, own country for, uh, first and, and what's going on. Um, any European countries, you clean clean house first within your, your within your home, you take care of things. And then you start to worry about the international community and what's going on there. I think within the United States, we need to be leaders, take care of our end of this problem. And once we do that, I think you'll see maybe a chain reaction globally. Yeah. Because, I mean, it just, it seems like the evidence is, is, is endlessly mounting. I, 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 it, it like, what, what do you think, what do you think it is preventing the major news networks from covering this? Is it, is it, like, is it literally like, isn't it that they get like 80% of their, their money is for, from TV advertising as pharmaceutical firms? Is it, is, is it literally this is, it could be. I mean, that, that's a good. That's a good question. So this is always about money. So here's a question: When does when does the, when do the pharmaceutical companies want to stop throwing money at this? And when do I start to get more clicks than the pharmaceuticals' money? So Tom Renz, I we're talking about this. So we, we've been noticing this with the way that our own names have been showing up in search analytic trends on different search engines and how our content is being presented through machine learning, because I've developed these platforms, are being presented to people. So as our stories become more consumed by the public, the more that you know, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, the more likely it is that, that Things will change because the 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 the, the momentum the momentum shifts the, the momentum changes. Like I said this this past week, the Zunati people, Doctor Dasik, Barrick, they're all there. They're the sycophants. They're they're losing following. 
they're deleting tweets. There's a shift happening. Mm. So as it starts to happen in social media, it will happen in the other platforms. I think, you know, I think the mainstream media follows social media. And I don't, I don't even know if the mainstream media is mainstream anymore because <laughs> nobody I know really consumes their information from um, Fox News, CNN, uh, MSNBC, whatever, ABC. I, I can't tell you the last time i personally watched a cbs abc or, or nbc news podcast i don't know who does watch that crap um i do look at cnn and fox news regularly just to see which one what they're talking about because they're mainstream and then i go to alternative news websites and I see what they're talking about and i'm looking for the differences in what they're talking about not so much like reading it for what they're saying because i assume whatever fox news and cnn is talking about is not important <laughs> <laughs> what they're, they're talking about is, is probably a distraction that's not always the case Okay, there's a broad sweeping generalization on my part. You know, for example, CNN did some really good work on on um, Hurricane Ian last week. And I thought they did a better job than Fox News. But when it comes to, you know, the things that really matter, the issues that are really facing the globe or our country, it doesn't seem like either one is talking about those things. And that's where I, I find those stories in alternative media sources. And I think you, you'd be concerned with this podcast. This is an example of an alternative news media or media source, right? You're not the mainstream. You're no. doing something different outside. No, no, I definitely couldn't be considered in the mainstream. I was laughing about how, um, the, 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 how bad and like institutionally rigid these, these th places have become, like prevent me from ever wanting to work for them. Like uh, people would have asked me, like, pre like uh, my my mom always envisioned me like going to work for like a TV network or like a radio network, like the in the in the UK that'd be like the BBC or uh, Channel Four. So it'd be like I don't know your equivalent like PBS or NPR maybe. Um, yeah. And, and I can I can go work for them because like I just couldn't say the truth. Like it's it's really bad, but that's 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 where what we've got to, un unfortunately. But yeah, I'm pleased to be able to have this. No, show. And, and scientists feel the same way, right? So like uh, the the Eric Weinstein's, the Brett Weinstein's, the Deborah Sows the world, you know, the intellectual dark web. You know, I'm definitely a, I'm one of those people now. I I could go back and work for an academic academic institution. I could go apply for faculty positions. I, I was a professor after I worked at at. Um, uh, equal of the lines. I could go back and apply for a government job. I even thought it'd be funny to go submit an application to FBI and CIA just to see what they'd say. Um, if they'd even return a phone call because, you know, I beat these guys. So um, obviously I'm, I, I know what I'm doing in terms of security, national security and, and um, getting the story and the word out, word out. But the, the point of that is what drives a person, you know, you, you hit a certain point of enlightenment or wisdom in your life when you realize you're better off doing this for yourself so you can be true to who you are than working for a large corporation where or the government where you're going to be censored. And you know, the the establishment looks at people like you and myself as very potentially harmful because I hope we're so. independent independent critical thinkers. So we're people like us are, you know, they they frown upon us. They, you know, we're we're harmful. We're we're a risk. We're a threat. Well, not really. I mean, the whole funny thing about the these about the FBI and the Michigan State Police harassing me is that, and my family is that, I'm just the messenger here, right? I, I maybe I'm a, uh, maybe maybe I, maybe a, a clever guy that figured it out and witnessed some things, and I just repeated back what happened. I didn't. Go, I wasn't engaged in the gain of function work myself. I saw it go down. I reviewed. I reviewed the proposal. I didn't work in the laboratory. I even raised concerns about the biosafety of these places when I saw it and I learned more. But you know, like, hey, I play by the book. I'm like, Doctor Dastic, I, I see there's a problem here. We should we should correct this problem. We're not going to correct that problem. Okay. So that's your boss telling you they're not going to do something. That's the way the world works. You know, you work in a, uh, you're an ethical person. You see a problem, you raise an objection. Your supervisor has the, the right to say yes or no to it. And then you move on with life. Mm. It, and it just turns out that, you know, the, the things that I was involved with, I did the right thing every step of the way. I did the ethical thing every step of the way. And really pointed out that these things happened. And instead of protecting people like Dr. Dasik, Dr. Anthony Fauci, we just need to hold them accountable, fix the problems in the system, at least in the United States, and move on with life. All we got to do is that simple. Oh, you make it all sound so easy. 
But I mean, it, it is. It, it's easy. It is easy. You just got to yeah. have people that are willing to do it. Yeah. And like, do, do you know what's really interesting about your story as well is that the, the number of people I've had on this show, and like, I have people from all sorts of like backgrounds, worldviews, everything, but like the number is mounting of people who I have on this show who are former veterans who have like gone to Afghanistan or Iraq or or they've the, some some war somewhere in the world for for their country and then you know come back and and then gone into to to retirement or um gone into work for for someone else and they they all all of them have come across my radar because they're just like people out there seeking to to tell the truth and and it's <sighs> It's both inspiring to see that many people coming out of like coming out of the the, the military, but also like the fact that that many people who that's what they're searching for are, are leaving public service. Not just in the case of the military, but then in your case, like just wanting to leave that the 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 public sphere because of yeah you know classification and not wanting to be a part of like the military industrial world anymore. But th- like you're the kind of person that should be in public service man like that that you know you're the person that i would have when i learned about the people who serve government in serving government in school or serve like in the civil service like you're the person the kind of person i imagine but it's it's sad to see that it's almost people like yourself are being driven out of that world well i don't know if it's ever being driven out nobody pushed me out of the public sphere of working it with a dot gov address oh no I mean, there's a sad reality the that culture that... okay well I, I think there's a couple different sides of it so one actually working in the space nobody pushes us out um if anything we get oh i mean i was elevated really fast within that sphere i mean i told you they're grooming me to be to be probably a leader of one of these these places what happens is you work, you see the frustration of some of the other government employees you work with. You don't make progress as fast as you want to. There's that reality working in the government. The other, the other side of it is um, the private sector will pay me three to four times as much. And without all the headaches, and when I say jump, someone will say how high and I'll be done the next day. Or, you know, maybe not. Corporate America is not always that way. But corporate America pays a lot. Or you can go to academia where you get to have more... Uh, freedom of thought, creativity, expression, and ultimate flexibility if you're a research faculty member. And there's a lot of appeal to that. So, so why work in the government, right? And, and it most for the most part, most academic institutions are like quasi-government. So there, there's that angle. So culturally, I think the shift is, is going to happen in, and they're going to push. You'll probably start seeing more veterans back on in in the, the domain. I mean, the, the thing that the it's common about veterans and who get out of the military is that um, we have loyalty. We have actually the combat veteran type Marine, Army infantrymen that, uh, you know, saw stuff. Not too many of us get advanced degrees. You know, a lot of times they go about their life and, um, you know, they don't want to be a part. They don't want to be in the spotlight a lot, a lot of people. Actually, I hate being in the spotlight. Um, my PTSD used to be so severe that I, I would, could barely give um, – public presentations after getting my PhD because my anxiety would get so high. Um, I've learned to deal with it over time. And, you know, here we are doing doing this. But um, th- we'll come back and, you know, veterans throughout at least U.S. history uh, have played a key role in maintaining security to safety and and supporting the government through through difficult times. This this is no different. Um, I think I think veterans will be here here today and, and in the future supporting our government. And I mean, what, there's a long range history of it. And, and a lot of us tend to understand, um, you know, there are divides in politics, right? So in the military, it tends to be more conservative. But when I when I was in the, the military, I was definitely a Democrat. And most people were Republicans. But guess what? We still fought together. We're still a cohesive team. We understood that we had our differences. And, w- you know, we had no problem in the military, in your train to, to, to be the bearer of bad news because there's no time on the battlefield for bullshitting each other about what's happening. Every time they, every second that you waste not communicating the facts as concisely and efficiently as you can, you put yourself at higher risk of some catastrophic accident happening or getting killed. You know, like 
you have to go tell your commander that you just went on a mission and 60% or 70% of your forces were eliminated. It was a huge failure. Well, guess what? You need to tell them that, you know, as fast as possible, efficiently as possible, and be truthful about it because the whole, you're going to lose the whole battle, you know, whole unit, unless you tell them. That. And the way that we handle veterans handle problems, no difference. The same way that I've been handling this SARS-CoV-2 Equal Health Alliance situation is that unless we plug the holes and gaps that have been identified, this will continue to happen. And, and nobody within the United States wants that. Nobody in the global community wants that. So let's just address the issues and move on. Well, I don't want to be in the limelight. I don't. I, I, I don't. It's so ridiculous that I have to go, you know, be a, be a media talking about this in the way from my world and the way I look at it. I'm like, this is so easy to solve. Let's just acting and delaying, and and I think it's having the opposite effect of what some of our ele elected leaders globally want to happen. So, for example, the more that they try to suppress the story, and the more that the facts come out from scientists and other analysts, which point to the exact opposite thing of what they've been told, the more angry and upset they're becoming with these people. So it's having the opposite effect. I, I can't I can't really understand why they, they continue to, to try pushing or suppressing, uh, suppressing the narrative but like I said, I think there's been a dramatic shift over the last two to three weeks, and I think the the end is near. Well, that feels like a very nice place in which to leave things. Uh, yeah, Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, yeah, you blew my mind a few times, um, and uh, yeah, just revealed some really fascinating bits of information. So uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been it's been fantastic. So everyone, check out uh, is Andrew's book, The Truth About Wuhan. Um, I will put the link to your um, congressional declaration in along with your uh, Twitter account for anyone. Is there anything else you'd like to plug before we finish? Yeah, just check me out on Twitter. It's where I'm most active. It's the only place that hasn't kicked me off uh, yet. Uh, it's A.G. Huff. So A-G-H-U-F-F. -F. Um, I'm on Getter, and I think I'm on True Social, too, but I rarely post or go over there because everyone's on Twitter. Um, other than that, I'm not too active on social media, but hopefully the truth comes out and the story comes to an end. Well, fingers crossed, man. Things like it seems like things are moving in the right <laughs> I direction. Think, I think we're getting. I think we're getting there. It, it's it's coming. It's just not as fast as anybody wants, but it's a tidal wave. And at least in the United States, the politics will be. Both sides will want to take ownership of being the winner and solving the problem before it's uh, everyone upset at both parties and it's political destruction for both. They nobody wants that. So politicians will wise up and take. Somebody will take credit for it and try to fix it. Yeah, well, they're just probably waiting until after the election. Yeah. That's, that, that's my guess. They, they're trying to push it past the election here in the U.S. Yeah, I can imagine. <sighs> Have fun with that. Those, those midterms, are, <laughs> they're going to be rocky. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yeah, anyway, man, uh, it's been been an absolute pleasure. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment for us in the comments below. Let me know what you thought and if you'd like to see more of this from the show. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.